Um, I grew up between those three places, you know, for the first 18, 19 years of my life. Yeah. Where, where, uh, where is your memory and your first memory of Jesus being real to you? Wow. Um, college. Okay. College, my college campus. I did not really believe in God, and ironically, I committed to play at a Bible college, huh. play sports at a Bible college. Yes. <laughs> I was like, man, what? And then, <laughs> uh, but uh, a buddy of mine told me that I should think about ministry. And when he told me that, I said, God doesn't want me. Uh-huh. And what he said was, read the story of Paul. So I read the story of Paul. And after I read the story of Paul, I remember there's a bridge on my college campus. And I was sitting on that bridge one night. I looked up. I said, God, if you're real, I'll commit my life to serving you. Uh-huh. A week and a half later, somebody invited me to be a youth pastor. Is that right? Wow, that is so cool. What a neat story. And, and now you're, you're giving your life to building Christ into students. If yep. you had a student sitting here today, what's one thing you want them to, to hear from you? What's a message you have for them? You can never go too far for God to bring you back home. Yeah, that's good. That is really good. And, uh, you know, now you've been all over the place. Tell South Park some of the places you've been doing ministry because you've been international, yeah. a, lot, a lot of different places. Yeah, so um, done ministry in Chicago, now Ohio. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, you've been all these places. Now yeah. you're in the promised land. Yeah, I am that's, in the you know, promised land. You know this is God's saying? country, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, yeah. But I've also been to France. I lived in France for about four months. I've been to Latvia. Um, I've been to Manchester, mm. you know, to the UK, been to Haiti, been to mm-hmm. Canada, um, you know, and uh, been to Dallas doing ministry. And uh, yeah, and now God has, has planted me yeah. and my family here, and we couldn't be more excited. And your family is who? You have Beth yes. and Gianna. Tell Beth, us about Beth and Gianna. Beth, my beautiful wife. She will be at the 11 o'clock service, so uh, I'm going to give her a big shout out then. Um, but, uh, <laughs> and then my daughter, Gianna, she'll be two. Uh, next month, yeah, um, she is. That is our miracle baby. Um, it was it was a process getting her here. Um, I thank God mm. every day, mm. um, you know. But um, yeah, so my, my daughter Beth, we've been married coming up on three years. Um, we've been together almost five. Okay, and then my my daughter Gianna, yes, yeah, she's yeah, two, and good. then my in laws are in Middletown. Yeah, good. Well, who's your favorite NBA team? Because I know you're a big basketball nerd, which, big... Had, which had nothing to do with why you got hired. No, nothing to do, nothing with, to do, it do at all. with it why you got hired. <laughs> 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 it doesn't hurt, though. I it can does, just tell yeah, you that yeah, right yeah, now. Yeah, so uh, it doesn't hurt. But, yeah, so I am a huge um, – a lot of people say my biggest character flaw is being a Lakers fan. Okay. Um, you yeah. know, they say that's my biggest yeah. character flaw. And, it, you know, it might be because the Lakers disappoint me every single year. Yeah. So. I know. I, it's got to be tough following a team yeah, uh, that's, yeah. it, it's gotta that's, be, that's won 17 championships. I'm sure has, that's yeah, really hard. It has to be tough. It's just like being a Browns fan. Um, yeah. 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 Sheesh. Don't. I'll pack up my office later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, no, we deserve all of the derision that we get. We deserve, we deserve it all. It's really good to have you here. I, Thank you. I know you have a passion for the Lord, for students, and, you know, you're joining us at a critical time in history, and we want to um, pray for you, pray for Gianna right now, pray for Beth, okay? So let's, let's do that before we get some announcements. Father, I thank you that you brought AJ and Beth and Gianna here to be a part of our family, to be a part of our mission to... In this case, connect students to Christ. And um, that's the highest calling that that all of us who are Christ followers have received. We just thank you that vocationally, AJ has decided to surrender to your call and uh, do it with all his life here. May you bless he and Beth with health and Gianna with growth and life prosper their work, bear much fruit through them. In Jesus we pray. And everyone said, amen. Give it up for AJ again. Thank you, buddy. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, a few things before we get started. Very excited today is the, the, final, the final installment of God, Israel, and us is today with Levi's going to teach us today. And then next week, we start the, the last section of Romans, Romans and relationships. It's all about relationships. You will not want to miss it as we talk about your relationship with your enemies, your relationship with your government. Is that, is that timely or what? Um, we're going we're gonna to talk about a lot of things in Romans 12 to 16, now through the end of June, and uh, we're, we're looking forward to that. We also have the Global Leadership Summit coming up August uh, 
uh, 8th and 9th, so you can sign up at DaytonGLS.com for an early bird special cost on that. We are one of their largest host sites for the summit, so it's a, it's a gathering usually about this size that comes together for that. We'd love for you to be a part of that. I'm excited about the fact that April 27th at 9 a.m. at Veterans Memorial Park is... Um, the event where Southbrook City Lights is going to join with Love Our City and help clean up Miamisburg. And uh, there'll be park cleanup, home landscaping, trash collection, painting, um, writing letters of encouragement to community leaders, prayer walkers, all kinds of stuff that we can do. I'd make the argument that there's nothing we do outside these walls more important than City Lights. So if you want to be a part of that and cleaning up... Miamisburg, you can go to our website. And then also, April 17th, that's a Wednesday, 6.30 a.m. and 7 p.m. Those are the two times our men's ministry meets on Wednesdays. And uh, our dear friend, Tony Miltenberger, is going to be a guest speaker that night. It'd be a great night to invite a friend, men. We, t- Tony has an amazing story. He is, has been a pastor. He is a pastor, and he's a veteran And he has a a gift of communication that he uses through his podcast. And uh, he's going to be with us uh, April 17th. The eclipse was amazing, wasn't it? And um, one of our gifted filmmakers, uh, our own Bailey Risk father, Mike Weber, uh, had a unique take on the eclipse. We thought we'd wrap up this week with a piece that Mike put together. Take a look at Mike Weber. The total solar eclipse traveling across 15 states, tens of billions of Americans witnessing. Everyone is unified and looking up at the sky together. It was a physical, an emotional, even a spiritual experience and a memory that will certainly last a lifetime. Wow, that really was incredible. I mean, if today doesn't get your heart racing and and get some kind of interest in our universe and the cosmos, I really don't know what would. Today actually reminds me of when I was a kid growing up, uh, my primary interest was in astronomy. And I remember the first book that I ever asked for was actually Carl Sagan's Cosmos. I remember receiving it on my birthday, and it was actually that book that uh, caused me to want to be an astronomer when I grew up. It was either that or a magician. Those were the two competing career paths uh, that I wanted to pursue. And so while I didn't become an astronomer or a magician, uh, I did continue to be interested in the field of science and physics. And when my kids were growing up, I would bring them up here onto the roof. I would lay out blankets for them and order them pizza. I would help them pick out the different constellations and uh, identify different stars. And of course, talk about our solar system and and we really had a good time. So while they were up here, we would do deep dives, particularly when they were teenagers, into things like philosophy and theology. And so something else that I would talk to them about is something that became very fascinating to me was about how modern science and cosmology looked like it was pointing toward a creator and how the more scientific discoveries that we made more and more looked like science was pointing toward a creation event. We would talk about the redshift in stars and Edwin Hubble's research there in Pasadena, California, and how his research looked like everything was going back to a spontaneous creation event. And even Einstein's own theory of relativity, when applied to the cosmos, seemed to force the idea that there was a singularity where the universe popped into existence out of nothing. And so I would tell them stories about Arno Penzi and Robert Wilson and how these two astronomers and physicists actually were the ones who discovered the very elusive background microwave radiation that would have existed at a particular measurement if everything sprang into existence from a creation event. Now, upon winning the Nobel Prize in physics, Arno Penzi famously said this, The best data we have are exactly what I would have predicted had I nothing to go on but the five books of Moses, the Psalms, and the Bible as a whole. And we would talk about the discovery of hundreds of universal constants and how scientists had come to realize 
that the laws of physics are so finely tuned that if you took any one of those laws and you tweaked it just to a hair's breadth, that not only was it impossible for life to exist, the universe itself would cease to exist. I love how Robert Jastrow put it. Robert Jastrow was an American astronomer. He was a planetary physicist, and he was a scientist for NASA. In his book, God and the Astronomers, Jastrow puts it this way. For the scientist who has lived by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He is about to conquer the highest peak. And as he pulls himself over the final rock, he is greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries. Now, I'm so grateful to have been born in a time and a place where we can see these scientific discoveries and look deep into the cosmos, actually, and help us better understand God's creation and our role in it. In fact, honestly, just how rare life really is in the universe and how special our life is. But the fact of the matter is, with all of that said, my faith and my belief in a creator isn't based on that scientific evidence. It's nice to have it. It's nice to help bolster the faith that I already have. But we don't need scientific discoveries to tell us what we should already know. In fact, I think the Apostle Paul puts it best, and, and today's a really good example of this. Paul writes it like this. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Hello? Uh, I have a personal pizza here for a, a mic. Oh, hey, right up here. Hey, do you want to hear a funny story about Einstein and his cosmological constant? Uh, no. Good morning, guys. Isn't it just amazing that God is the creator of our universe and that he gives us glimpses of his power every single day? Let's continue to praise and worship our God together. So if you guys will stand and join with us. Fill me 
being a God who shows up for us, a God who comes through for us time and time again. We love you and we thank you so much for this time together this morning. Amen. You can have a seat. Morning, Southbrook. So if you came in a little late, you might have missed that Charlie introduced uh, a new member of our staff team, AJ. He's the next gen director. And this is really exciting. AJ and his wife, Beth and Gianna. Uh, what we know, this scary statistic, it says that 80% of those who come to faith in Christ do so before they reach the age of 17. So the stakes are high with students. And I'm excited for AJ and his family, what they're going to do here. I hope that their, their participation in our community blesses them as much as it's going to bless us. Uh, Reverie, this effort that many of you participated with years ago, because of Reverie and the way that it meets people in our community, we are able to fund staff positions like AJ. And that just goes to show to you what your generosity, even from years back, the fruit that it's producing, but also that there is still so much ground to gain. So if you participate in generosity with us, that is part of what it, uh, uh, marks a Christian, one who uh, lives the generous life of Jesus. But if you're kind of kicking the tires, we welcome you to kick the tires of generosity too, not just the church, and you'll see how uh, not only does our generosity impact other people, but it also changes us from the inside out, so you can do that through Push Bay. Uh, we have giving stations around the room, and you can also give at the information center. So this is really part two of Romans 11, and uh, to me, this might be one of the most challenging chapters in all of the New Testament. I think a good indication of that is if you hop online and you start looking for churches that have done Roman series, most of them stop after chapter 8. But here we are, trudging through chapter 11, and I think one of the reasons why teachers, they, they shy away from teaching on chapter 11 is because there is a risk that if you lead people to an incorrect interpretation of these verses, that it can make people religious zealots, people who are more concerned about enforcing the rules of who is in and outside of God than they are trying to welcome people in. Charlie said last week, some of the worst people you've ever met are religious. This comedian, Emo Phillips, he had a bit that exposed these kinds of people. He said, once I saw this guy on a bridge about to jump, I said, don't do it. He said, nobody loves me. I said, God loves you. Do you believe in God? And he said, yes. I said, are you a Christian or are you a Jew? And he said, I'm a Christian. I said, me too. Are you Protestant or Catholic? And he said, I'm Protestant. Me too. What denomination? He said, Baptist. I said, me too. Are you Southern or Northern Baptist? And he said, I'm Northern Baptist. I said, are you Northern Conservative Baptist or Northern Liberal Baptist? He said, I'm Northern Conservative Baptist. I said, me too. What about Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes region or Nor Northern Conservative Baptist Eastern region? He said, I'm Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes region. I said, me too. Then I said, are you Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes region Council of 1879 or Council of 1912? And he said, I'm Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1912. I said, die heretic, and I pushed him off the bridge. <laughs> the, the point is that the gospel was never about people achieving a level of rightness, being in the right denomination or righteousness to deserve God's love, and it's not even about making bad people good. It is about God bringing the dead 
to life. You see, in Ephesians, uh, Paul also wrote this book. He says, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us good with Christ. He, He made us alive with Christ. Even when we're dead in transgressions, it is by grace that you've been saved. So before we get back into chapter 11 of Romans, we're going to take a quick tour through uh, the books that are called the prophet books. Now, a lot of us, when we think about prophets, we picture this fortune teller who's going to tell us about the future, but it's actually not the role of a biblical prophet. They are simply a person that is commissioned by God to speak on his behalf to the people of Israel so they knew what God was doing and could participate and what he was doing. Joel has these words to say on God's behalf. He says, It shall come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drop new wine, and his hills shall flow with milk, and all the rivers of Judah shall flow with waters, and a fountain will come forth of the house of the Lord, and the water of the valley of... You got to be really careful about how we say this word, because I'll admit I have more practice saying a different, similar word. And the water, the valley of Shittim. <laughs> so, what's interesting to me, and this is missed by a lot of the readers, because we get distracted by this word, but the water and that God is bringing to this valley is significant. We don't see water as significant today because it is so accessible to us. But in this era, their livelihood was agriculture and livestock, and you can't survive unless you're able to cultivate livestock and agriculture. So for them, water equaled life. And it's curious to me that that Joel, he gives us the specific name of this valley, the Valley of Shittim. And if you look up in a Bible encyclopedia, encyclopedia, Shittim, which I'm sure many of you have, there are two submissions. The first is, it is a proper noun for the lower portion of the Kidron Valley outside of Jerusalem on the way to the Dead Sea. It's an actual place. The second submission says it's a synonym for any of the wadis in Israel. A wadi is barren land. There's no signs of life. There's no fertility. If you were a Jew and somebody said, hey, what do you think about that land over there? Do you think we should get it? No, that's, you, don't, you don't want to farm over there. That's shatim. What about this donkey? This guy's going to give me a great deal on it. Total shatim. <laughs> I don't know about you, but if you've ever taken a trip to a landfill, it shocks you. And then the next time that you, you're going to go back, you kind of have to psychologically prepare yourself for what you're going to experience again. Because you see not only just the vultures circling whatever is left that's salvageable, you see heaps and heaps of all of these materials that once had a purpose and now they're discarded as total trash. And the stench when you walk into a landfill is, it makes you go, wow. And when Jesus walked through the Kidron Valley with his disciples the night uh, that he went to the Garden of Gethsemane and he was betrayed, this is what they would have seen. They wouldn't have just seen trash. They would have seen what their culture saw as human trash. What they would do if, if a person passed away and they didn't have family or, or the, uh, with funds and they didn't have a way to pay for a funeral, the most inexpensive way was to throw the remains of a person onto the pile of heap in the Kidron Valley. When, in fact, when an angel took the prophet Ezekiel to the valley, Ezekiel had these words to say about what he saw. A great many bones on the floor, bones that were very dry. Ezekiel says, there's no way anything good or desirable can come from this place. But God says, I will take my river and I'll send it 
through the valley of Shittim, and life will spring up in a place that you and I can only imagine trash. It's a total wasteland. This is the story of the gospel saying, you just watch, I'm going to bring life to the most dead place that you have ever seen, and we want to say there's no way that can happen. You've got to be Shittim me. <laughs> if you know me, you knew I wouldn't be able to hold that back. The, the promise of following Jesus is that he turns wastelands into flourishing life. And then Isaiah, he says, this is what the life looks like that God brings. Wilderness and desert will sing joyously. The badlands will celebrate and flower like the crocus in spring bursting into a blossom, a symphony of song and color, mounting glories of Lebanon, a gift, awesome, awesome caramel, stunning sharing gifts. So Lebanon and caramel sharing... These are the three most thriving places. These are the places you want to be. And suddenly, this same blessing is on the Valley of Shittim. God's resplendent glory, full on display. God awesome, God majestic. Energize the limp hands, strengthen the rubbery knees, tell fearful souls, courage, take heart. God is here, right here on his way to put things right and redress all wrongs. He's on his way. He'll save you. Now we're ready for Romans 11. We know that God is not just about making bad people good, but he's about bringing the dead to life. And Paul, he kicks right into verse 16 with this analogy of life, the life that God has on offer, and he uses an olive tree for the symbolism here. He says, behold, underneath all this, there is a holy God-planted, God-tended root. If the primary root of the tree is holy, there's bound to be some holy fruit. Some of the tree's branches were pruned and you wild olive shoots were grafted in. I'm gonna pause you and I, most of us, anyone who is not a Jew, is a wild olive shoot. Yet the fact that you are now fed by that rich and holy root gives you no cause to gloat over the, the pruned branches. So the pruned branches were the Jews, the ones who were originally part of, of God's redemption initiative for humanity. And so they're pruned back. Remember, you aren't feeding the root. The root is feeding you. Now, in horticulture, there's this strategy, a technique called grafting. I don't really know anything about it. But what I do know is that a gardener could cultivate and manage bringing in a branch from another olive tree and graft it into an existing older olive tree root. So what this shows to us is that God's grace is so abundant that even those who seem far from God, us wild olive branches, are still within his reach. And this is the good news of the gospels. Jesus said over and over, the kingdom of God is near, which means that you and I are not as far from him as we think. But very quickly, Paul moves from this good news to a warning and it's a warning of arrogance. He said, you're only here because of God. So if at any point you start to think that you're in with God for another reason, you're gonna be pruned back. St. Augustine says that the most valuable truth in this world is like the ring that a groom gives to his fiance. The ring is beautiful and it's valuable and the girl who receives it will undoubtedly find herself staring at its beauty. But how tragic if she ever got so enamored with the ring that she forgot the ring giver. But she should never forget the love and the commitment to which this ring points is the real treasure. This is why I got my wife a yellow 25 carat, no, 0.25 carat engagement ring. <laughs> it's certainly possible to say other branches were pruned so that I could be grafted in. Well and good, we've seen this happen. But they were pruned because they were dead wood, no longer connected by belief and commitment to the root. The only reason you're on the tree is because your graft took when you believed and because you're connected to that belief nurturing root. So don't get cocky and stretch your branch. Be mind, humbly mindful of the root that keeps you lithe and green. If it's by our belief that God has grafted us in, don't think for any other reason that you're here. As Charlie said last week, nothing earned, 
everything given. The moment that we turn from receiving a, a gift and thinking that we earned it is the very moment that you begin denying the gift, which also denies the gift giver. And this is what religion looks like. Religion makes arrogance. It makes people think that they've earned their place, where they are. Grace makes humility. And here's, well, just hear the contrast of what these two sound like. Religion sounds like, wow, God, look at all I've done for you. Grace sounds like, God, how can I ever thank you for all you've done for me? This is how God responds to religion. If God didn't think twice about taking pruning shears to the natural branches, Israel, why would he hesitate over you? After all, we're wild. He wouldn't give it a second thought. Make sure you stay alert to these qualities of gentle kindness and ruthless severity that exist side by side in God. Ruthless with the dead wood, gentle with the grafted shoot, but don't presume on his gentleness. The moment you become dead wood, it is game over. And your reaction to those words might be like mine. I think, God, why are you so ruthless? Because God's love, it appears contradictory to us. How can love be kind, yet also severe? And so this paradox is present all through scripture. God's desire, as Paul says, is that anyone who comes to believe in him would stay in him and flourish. Paul says this, if they don't persist in remaining dead wood or persist in their arrogance, they could very well be grafted back in. Don't you hear how Paul and God are rooting for us? That wasn't a pun, but I kind of like how it worked out. See, the paradox is that God is kind. All we deserve is condemnation, not second chances. And God's heart is still clear in Isaiah 42. He says, a bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. God's kindness is undeniable. But so is his commitment to serious action to remove a dead branch. And for those of us who get this, you start to understand how the fear of the Lord is beginning the beginning of wisdom. And this does not mean that the wise people run around scared of God. What it means is that the wise people take God seriously. To fear God doesn't mean we're scared. It means, all right, He's serious, but he's serious on my behalf. Charlie also mentioned last week that God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Arrogance is like cancer in faith. And if, and if a surgeon, if she sees cancer on a routine surgery, what is she going to do? She's going to do anything that she can to remove the cancer because the cancer equals death. So what if I'm the arrogant branch? What if I'm... The one that needs pruned, will God remove me? But God does not prune branches because he doesn't care for them. God prunes branches because he does care for them. C.S. Lewis says these, these remarkable words, that the hardness of God, the hardness of God is kinder than the softness of men. Have you ever had a person who knew um, something about you that you needed to fix but they weren't willing to say it to you because they wanted to be polite. Is that actually kindness? It's not. So what God does is he's willing, even if we are the issue, to say it to us. The hardness of God is kinder than the softness of men, and his compulsion is our liberation. His compulsion, that's his serious action, is for our salvation. God is so serious about removing arrogance because, and get this, he knows that it is our greatest hindrance to experiencing his grace. And it, once you really start to get this paradox and you understand it inside of you, what you realize is there's an, there should be an overwhelming relief that God, he cares so seriously about you being with him that he will not allow you to misunderstand his grace. Jesus himself gave a story, probably one of the most famous parables of all scripture, 
so that we would understand this, and it's the prodigal son. Now, if you were to ask someone randomly, hey, what, what is the prodigal son about? Most of us would recall only a portion of the prodigal son, which is scene one. And in scene one, we have this, these warm, you know, fluffy sentiments of a, a son who insulted his father, took all of his, father, his portion of the estate from his father, and he went and he spent it all on prostitutes, and he ran, runs out of money, and so he comes home, walking the path home with his head held low, and his father runs to him and warmly embraces him. Now, that is a characteristic of God, but God is not one-dimensional. There is more to this story. And the audience who Jesus was originally speaking to would have left after this story, angry, frustrated, and haunted. So you've got the younger brother who he wants what the father has, he wants the father's possessions more than he wants the relationship with the father. So he basically says, hey, uh, I'm in the best years of my life. Yours are almost done. How about we just imagine you're dead so I can have your stuff and go and live my life? And then the father welcomes him home. What does he do? He doesn't punish the son. In fact, it says that he kills the fattened calf. In that day, meat was a delicacy. And if you're going to eat some meat, you're probably not going to kill a fattened calf unless you are going to throw a party for the entire village. So here's this entire village, and they're making noise, and they're singing songs, and they're celebrating the lost son come home. And the older brother, who's still working in the fields, overhears all of this noise, and so he comes up to the house, and he asks the servant what is going on, and the servant says, oh, your brother's home, and your father's throwing a celebration. And the older brother, he stays outside of the house, and he keeps staying and staying, even though there's this amazing party taking place to celebrate the unity of their family again. So the father, he realizes that the older son won't come in, so he ends up leaving on the, on the greatest day of this father's life. He's pulled from the celebration to go speak to the elder brother and invite him in. And the elder brother is still so stubborn. He can't get him to come in to celebrate. Because what the older brother saw is a younger brother who did everything wrong and is still getting the blessing of the father. Meanwhile, the older brother has been doing everything right and he's not celebrated. And by the way, when the father's killing a fattened calf, the older brother sees that as the portion of the estate that he's going to inherit being used. So what's happening is Jesus is telling us this. Both of the brothers, they wanted the wrong thing. One of them wanted the wrong thing the wrong way, the younger brother who took everything and squandered it. The older brother wanted the wrong thing the right way because he followed all of the rules but still was missing the whole point. They, they wanted the possessions of the father more than they wanted the proximity of the father. And so what the audience of Jesus would have heard is that there are two kinds of lostness. And it would have been frustrating to them because they would have thought, oh, I've got this figured out. I'm all good. And Jesus goes, no, no. You can be lost and be moral and religious. And you can be just as lost with immorality and irreligion. This is why it is our fundamental mission to connect people to Christ, not religion. We don't want any distractions. We want to take you straight to the source. There's a lot of people in the church, and probably this very church, that have an elder brother type of heart. And in your heart you say, God, I pray, I try to be obedient, I serve in SBK, uh, and therefore God owes me a good life and should take me to heaven when I die. All of your morality, all of your religion is just a way to get the possessions of the Father. See, most of us think that God wants people to have a, to be changed from being bad to being good, but God wants people close to him. 
Because if he is the source of life, proximity with him gives us life. Now, for the sake, sake of time, I'm going to move pretty quickly through these next few verses, all right? I want to lay all this out on the table as clearly as I can, friends. This is complicated. And Paul the Apostle, probably the greatest force inside of the history of the church, if he says it's complicated, you better believe it's complicated. He says it would be easy to misinterpret what's going on and arrogantly assume that you're royalty. They're just rabble out on their ears for good, but that's not it at all. This hardness on the part of the insider Israel toward God is temporary. Its effect is to open things up to all of the outsiders so that we end up with a full house. Before it's all over, there will be a complete Israel. Now what the error a lot of people make when they read this is they start to see it as a mystery to solve instead of a story that God is writing. And they see, okay, Before it's all over, there's some sequence here, there will be a complete Israel. So does that mean that any Jew across all of time is going to come back to God, deceased and living? Uh, Is it just Jews that are living in a specific event? Is God going to bring back those who are only full-blooded Jews or partial Jews? And when exactly is this going to take place? And the list goes on and on and on, but it's not for us to solve, it's for us to get excited about what God is doing. And then verse 27, Paul says, as it is written, a champion will stride down from the mountain of Zion. This is Jesus. And he'll clean house in Jacob. And this is my commitment to my people, removal of their sins. So what happens when God's life gets into you is he does renovate you. He's not going to let you stay bad. He's going to have you come to life with all of his goodness and the removal of your sins will be a part of it. Then he says, from your point of view, as you hear and embrace the good news of the message, it looks like the Jews are God's enemies, that they're on the outside. But looked at from the long range perspective of God's overall purpose, they remain God's oldest friends. God's gifts and God's call are under full warranty, never canceled, never rescinded. In Israel, the people that gave up on God are going to find that God has not given up on them. And this is the same attitude that we should represent towards those who we see have given up on God, that we're going to keep praying for them. What our focus should be is being the welcome party. And the, the more that you pray for people who are lost, the more that God is pruning the heart in you, the tendency for us to become the older brother. And we're going to cheer people on until, as Paul said, it is a full house. Yeah. By the way, this is why there is, there is no room for us as Christians to be anti-Semitic. And there's also no room for us as Christians to be anti-Palestine because both are the lost sons and daughters of God. Tim Keller has this to say about God's grace. He has no favorites and he has no least favorites. His grace is abundant and there is enough for all. He's not going to play the game. Just as you who are one time disobedient to God, I'll get this, this is so good, have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy for you. What this is saying is Israel gave up on God. Now God is grafting us in, and Israel is going to see all the good and the life that God is giving us because what happens with the gospel and and, and changed lives is it's contagious. For God has bound everyone over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. So let me just summarize that for you. All are disobedient. All who are disobedient are candidates for God's grace. Therefore, All of us are candidates for God's grace. And what kind of God is so gracious that he even uses our disobedience as a way to give us blessing? What kind of God, he takes our rebellion of him and he works it into the good plan that he has for your life. You know, the cross is the the most ultimate expression of human rebellion. And at the very same time, it is the instrument 
of our salvation. The irony of the gospel is that we live through the death of the God that we murdered, and what kind of God would do that? Only the God who doesn't seek bad people who become good. But dead people come into life. Religion says, like, hey, if, if you want to be in with God, you got to take care of your mess first. And, and you got to quit smoking, you got to quit being greedy, you got to quit cussing, you got to quit gossiping. And if you stop doing blank, then, then you're in a good standing with God. And everyone who falls for that either finds themselves exhausted and defeated because they can't earn their way up, or they trick themselves into thinking that they actually can, and now all they're left with is a shell of religion and their arrogance. But God makes himself accessible to you in a so much easier way through just intimate relationship with him. God wants your humble belief and commitment. And, and to be grafted in, this is how simple it is. You confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you say from this moment on, I'm gonna die to myself and put my trust in him as the way the truth, and the life. And you can do that. It doesn't have to be an all heads bowed, every eye closed, ask Jesus into your heart. It can just be finding a person that you know who is a Christ follower, pulling them aside and saying, I want to follow Jesus and I'm going to commit to him. And you say those very words that I just said with them to God. Because to be grafted in means that the waters of God, his life-giving waters are gonna move through the Kidron Valley of your life and the death and the shatim will be replaced with his goodness. Hallelujah. Yeah. Yes. Amen. Amen. Every weekend, uh, we, we close with the opportunity for communion. And when we do this, we're saying, yes, Father, I'm gonna come to your feast. And so I know it takes a couple extra minutes of your time and it's not enough food for birds, but it is so critical that we are pursuing proximity with the Father. And this is a great way to continually do that and make sure that we are preventing arrogance from springing up in our lives. And instead of saying, God, look at all I've done for you, we say, I can't believe all you've done for me. Father, I thank you for how your gospel, it never gets old. None of us ever graduated. There's not a 101 fundamentals class that we can just all say past it and move on. But instead, you continually bring us back and you say, hey, remember the main thing. And it's all about you. So let us be people that are all about you. Let us be a church that we're obsessed with this place becoming a full house and that we'd constantly be inviting in and celebrating the lost brother and sister. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and our church said all together, amen. amen. Have a great week.